Um, I'm going to present a talk about psychedelics and Asian African yoga, Smaitawi. Um, I'm a teacher of Smaitawi and I help people to become better versions of themselves by using yoga and meditation techniques uh, to empower them. I use yoga myself in my journey. Uh, a couple of years ago, or two years ago, I um, was active in the media as a news presenter, a journalist. And um, I started yoga when I realized that I was having everything in my life, travels, uh, a good job, a nice family, uh, a fiance, but nothing was fulfilling me. And because I didn't know why nothing was fulfilling me or making me happy, um, I, decided, I decided to quit everything and just make an inward journey. And that's when I started to do yoga. So when I started yoga, I started off with Bikram yoga. Ah, thank you. I started off with Bikram yoga, um, which is um, a very physical exercise, not so spiritual, but a very physical exercise, good for your muscles, good to get a nice stretch. Um, this is Mr. Bikram, by the way. It's in a, a hot room of 40 degrees with a humidity 40%. Um, and that really helped me, not in a spiritual way, but it helped me to just release some tension in my body and to get more focus, get more clarity, and you name it. But I was diving more into yoga because it really got me. And I was trying different styles. And the more styles I was trying, the more I was discovering the spiritual aspect of yoga. But in the West, um, I don't know where you guys are from, but probably all over the world, yoga is very popular and it becomes more and more popular. There are so many different styles and very creative styles as well. There's trap yoga nowadays, where they combine yoga with dancing and twerking and you name it. Uh, there's even surf yoga, where you try to balance yourself on a surfboard. Um, really good for the core. There's even naked yoga. There's marijuana yoga, there's wine yoga, there's like all kinds of yogas. And all these things have one thing in common, that it's there, it's an experience to discover a different aspect of yourself. But the whole spiritual aspect of it is pretty much um, vanished. And there's a quote from one of the sons of uh, a big Hatha yoga teacher who traveled around the world to pass over the knowledge of Hatha yoga, by that time a spiritual practice. But the son of this teacher says, when I see what yoga has become in the West, I, I wish my father has left it with the hermits in the caves. And there's another quote from a famous Hollywood actress who says, I don't want yoga to change my life, just my butt. And this is to show you that yoga in the West and in America is being promoted as a physical exercise. It's good for your body, good for your, for your mind, but there's no deepness in it. Although I must say, all those practices, you know, um, for example, it's as simple as yoga, as simple as naked yoga. I do think, in a sense, it's a spiritual thing because um, spirituality is for us to cut the human bondage, bondages. And as much as I believe we are all one, and as much as I think I am comfortable, comfortable with my own body, if you would put me in a room with naked people to do naked yoga, I would feel really uncomfortable. So I know there's like a human thing uh, that I still need to be working on and develop for myself. And naked yoga would be working for me um, to uh, develop at least like an emotional aspect of myself. But Bikram yoga, physical, um, and I think all kinds of yoga match or fit in one of these or two or three. But not the whole circle, so not the whole union, developing yourself on a mental level, on a spiritual level, on a physical level, and on an emotional level. And that's what Smaitawi, the original yoga, had. It's a complete system, a spiritual system for self-development. And uh, this symbol represents Smaitawi. It refers to Upper Egypt and the Lower Egypt, two lands. Smaitawi means union of two lands, and it's symbolic for uh, our lower selves and our higher selves, our ego selves and our soul selves. So in every religion, they talk about union or in cultures and in philosophies, and it's all about the union 
between your individual consciousness with your collective consciousness to make that connection with your divine source. Here's another version of Smaita Wee. Uh, this one represents duality that we're all facing. And uh, maybe you already know this story of Horus and Set uh, and the ongoing battle. If you don't know, just think about the Lion King. There's this great king, the lion, uh, the king of uh, the jungle, the good guy. And then there's his evil brother or the jealous brother in the film, the bad guy. So you can see it as your soul self and your ego self. And then there's this battle because they both want to be the ruler of the kingdom. So your ego and your soul both want to be the ruler of your kingdom, of your mind. And it's not about killing the one or the other, it's about the interplay between the two. It's about the balance between the two. Because the more I uh, get connected to the spiritual community, the more I hear stuff about killing your ego and get rid of your ego, but that's not the point. The point is to balance those two and not to get rid of your ego because you really do need your ego in this world. Um, so Smaitawi is about the union, exploring yourself and making this um, connection. The ancient Kemets believe that everything comes from one source. You, me, animals, nature, everything comes from one source and the same patterns um, are expressed on different planes. And the ancient Kemets also believed that one of their purposes in life was to reflect the perfection and the order and the balance that the creator manifested in the universe and in nature. So they have many deep knowledge uh, and teachings about uh, the universe and about us. So for example, Seven Hermetic Principles that says that everything um, has its feminine and its male counterpart. Everything has feminine and male energy. Everything is dual. So um, we need to have this ego for us to have like a reference point wherein we can experience something. Because if everything is good and there's no bad, then there's nothing to experience. If there's always only truth and there's no lies and there's no truth to seek, then there's no truth to to chase. So it's all about those opposites. You always need the opposites. And in there, we have existence. Um, also, one of uh, their teachings is that everything is vibration. You need to see everything in terms of energy. So your thoughts are energy. The words that you speak are energy. The things that you're seeing on television is energy. So everything is affecting your energy. And that's why Smaita Wi, uh, which means union, it's like a path. It's not a practice. It's not a yoga practice. It's a path to enlightenment. And uh, it covers many different things, not just body postures, but uh, also controlled breathing. Because everybody is breathing here. Nobody has to command, uh, com command their minds to breathe. That's something you do subconsciously, luckily. But we can also consciously try to control our breath and get into an altered state of consciousness. So why this breath is important is because it's a way to release toxins from our bodies. It's a way to get into an altered state of consciousness. It's a way to explore yourself. And especially in this world where we're being injected with fear and negative energy, um, it's very important for us to rebalance ourselves and get rid rid of that energy. So if you're watching TV all the time, you're watching news all the time, um, when your mind or when your eyes see something negative, it starts to release cortisol in your body, stress hormones. And then it's your job to get rid of those stress hormones. And that's what people are not aware of it. They pay 15 pounds to go to a cinema to watch a horror movie two hours long where you allow the directors to inject you with fear. And then you go home and the fear is still in your body. And the stress hormones are the cause of many diseases. So that's why it's really important to release those. And you can use your breath uh, to release those toxins. Especially if you combine it with body postures, you can allow yourself to reach different points of your body and develop those areas. Smaitawi is not only about yoga, meditation. It's a whole lifestyle. It's, about, it's promoting a healthy lifestyle. So it's about everything you see 
It's about the, the conversations that you engage in, what words do you use. Um, it's about healthy foods, what are you eating. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very broad. It's all about consciousness. Um, the tree of life, uh, represented in many different religions. In almost every religion, you see a tree of life. And the tree of life is the tree of wisdom, the tree of knowledge. And in ancient Egypt, they also have a tree of life. And it's, all, it's, it's an acacia tree. And the acacia tree um, contains DMT, uh, or psychoactive um, ingredients. So I grew up as a Muslim. So drugs or psychoactive ingredients or plant medicines was, was is a big taboo. So I never um, tried to even connect it with religions, you know, psychedelics with religions um, or any other spiritual um, paths. Because for, my, for me, in my opinion, it was like a big taboo. Um, and it's a drug. <laughs> but, you know, um, as we all might know, um, when you go into these realms, when you go to these worlds, there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of knowledge there that we can download. And many practices, uh, like Smaitawi, uh, like martial arts, but Kalindi, I can tell you more about that. All these practices come out of these realms, come out of these worlds. They come out of the tree of life. But the tree of life, it, it all depends on how you see it, because there are different ways of um, seeing that. The tree of life is also a system that resides inside of us. But I'll come back to that later. This slide first. Um, this is just to show you a quote um, that supports psychedelics. So in the, in the lower part, Harmel seems to be used in Coptic Egyptian rituals, an initiatory invocation that refers to a noob tree identified with Harmel which would have played the symbolic role of tree of life that holds the universe and under which Osiris resides. And up here is uh, Bess, the god of liberation. Um, but just to show you that different practices or different cultures were using plant medicines in their developments. The tree of life, um, also known as the chakra system um, in the Hindu tradition or in the Jewish tradition as the Kabbalah system. So the tree of life, these are the chakras are energy centers in your body. Each energy center governs an emotional state and a physical state and a spiritual state. So there's prana energy flowing in these chakras. And when the flow is not good or when it's being blocked, so let's, let's take this example. This is your root chakra that connects you with your earth element. So if this chakra is flowing, you will have a great sense of uh, safety. You will feel very safe and uh, you will feel very grounded. And um, if it's not balanced, you will have a lot of fear-based thoughts. And you know your actions will be fear-based. You will take less risks, and you name it. So it's all about governing all these energies, empowering these energies inside of you, so you can become your best version. Let me take this uh, example. Ma'at. Ma'at is the goddess of order, truth, balance, and justice. Um, and that's, uh, that refers to your communication center. So if you feel like you're having troubles with expressing yourself, or maybe you're catching yourself um, lying about small or big things. But if you need to empower your expressions, there's a yoga posture that we can use for that. This is the pose of Ma'at. Ma'at is depicted down here again. So let me start at the bottom. Uh, it's to strengthen your ankles, to strengthen your hips. We divide the, the body in two, so the upper body is different from the uh, lower body, and then you move your head to your left and your right to open up the glands in your throat. So if you're having a hard time expressing yourself, it means that there are a lot of stress hormones and a lot of toxins in your throat center. So this is a posture um, 
to develop that energy, to release that energy. So if you are able to um, balance the throat chakra, you will become a person of ma'at. You will become ma'at because you become a person of truth. You become a person of justice. You become a person of order. So it's all about becoming these forces, becoming these gods and goddesses. And you don't have to, but if you don't do so, if you do it, it's your strength and there's opportunities that come out of it. And if you don't do it, it will become your weakness and threats will come out of it. Um, we have another simple posture. It's not that simple. It's a simple posture, but it's pretty hard. You sit on curled toes because of all these pressure points that we have in our feet. And these pressure points correspond with different organs in our bodies, uh, oh, with our lungs, with the pineal gland, uh, and many different things. So if you sit on curled toes and give your toes a big stretch, and have, you know, apply a controlled deep breathing, you can give a cleanse to all these organs. This is God Min, he represents fertility and the control over one's sexual desire. Uh, so there's one yoga posture, the pose of Min, where we stand like this and we open up the meridian that goes from your hand straight to your heart to open up the flow in that meridian. And you know, if as a man you're finding troubles with um, sexual activities, um, you can open up that flow and that will increase the blood circulation in that meridian and in, um, yeah, down there. So <laughs> it works. Um, this is Salket, this is the scorpion goddess of magic and healing. Uh, there's a posture where we put our palms up and then try to empower our energetic bodies. So everybody is aware we have a physical body, but we have 10 energetic bodies. And you guys all know about the aura, aura, that's the seventh energetic body, but we have 10 energetic bodies. So in this posture, we try to energize and empower the auric field, our energetic, our energetic bodies. So you don't pick up on other people's energy and you stay centered in your own energy. So if your chakras are flowing and if your aura is strong, it looks more like this. And then you attract good things in your life. You attract positive people, positive situations, and you name it. And if it's the opposite, if, you're, you know, if your aura is weak, if your uh, chakras are not empowered, not balanced, you attract the complete opposite because you're just more vulnerable and open to other people's energy. Selket, goddess Selket, depicted in a different form as Maria in uh, Christianity. Also here, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it, but Selkat is always depicted with her hand palms up. And it's the same with Maria, always depicted with her hands up because of the healing energy that we all have in our palms. So we personified gods and goddesses to learn different aspects of ourselves. So Maria, in this case, is the healing energy that we all have in the palms of our hands. Um, we use that same gesture in duas, doing dua, duas, so receiving uh, and giving prayers. And I remember growing up as a Muslim, we pray, pray five times a day. And after each prayer, my mom told me, you need to put your hands up and you need to ask God for the things that you want or the things that you want to be. And I never understood why we had to pray. And I especially didn't understand why we had to do the hands like this, because I thought if I talk to God and I do it like this, they, he can understand me too, right? Why do I need to do it like this? And I never had an answer on that, but it's because of that healing energy in the palms of your hands. So if you pray upon something and you direct your hands towards yourself, you literally send that energy to you. And the other way around, if I want to give you something or give you energy, then I just flip my hands and direct my energy to you. So that's very powerful. All right, let's look to this time schedule and the practice of Smaitawi, of yoga, and um, where it was being practiced, uh, practiced. So here you can see different temples. And I want you to remember this name. So the temple of Het Heru. So here we can see all the practices in uh, ancient Africa. And then the first practice in India is Hatha Yoga. And Hatha Yoga was being introduced as a 
a yoga to uh, balance your male and your feminine energy. Afterwards, you can see different kinds of yoga styles, Kundalini yoga, uh, Ashtanga yoga that has been developed. But how did the practice from Africa go into India? How did that happen? It's because of this, these people right here. The majority of our teachings that we know nowadays come from the Tantra tradition. And the Tantra is the spiritual path of the Dravidians. Dravidians are descendants from Ethiopia. So as they traveled from uh, Africa to India, they took along their knowledge, their, you know, their spiritual path, their language, their traditions, and you name it, and they passed it uh, down to the Indians by an oral tradition. But many knowledge that we know when it comes to astrology, astronomy, chakras, uh, and hatha yoga comes from the Dravidian people. But the Indians were the first ones to capture it in the Vedas, in the oldest written text. Uh, let's go to this place. This is Mount Maru. Um, and this is the place where knowledge about the chakras and energy system began. And this mountain, this is a holy, uh, a sacred mountain, and it represents the journey of life, starting at the bottom of the mountain, the root chakra that connects you with the earth, uh, all the way up to the, top of the uh, to the top of the mountain, which is the crown chakra that connects you with the universal consciousness. And um, this Mount Maru um, is in, uh, it appears in as well ancient Egyptian mythology as in Indian mythology, and that's why we know that both group had access to this information. So here another picture of the Dravidians with the dreadlocks. Um, and let's go to Hatha, Hatha Yoga, and the name. Because the name Hatha, or the word Hatha, can be divided in two. Ha means sun, and Tha means moon. And as I said, Hatha Yoga uh, is practiced to balance the two opposite forces in our bodies, your male energy and your feminine energy. Um, Hatha comes from the word or the name Hathor, that's a Greek goddess, the goddess of the sun and the moon. And Hathor comes from the name that I told you to remember, Het Heru, that's the Egyptian god, uh, goddess of the sun and the moon, the two opposite forces. Um, the goddess of the sun and the moon, also known as the cow goddess, gifted us with many beautiful things. Um, Cows, meat, uh, milk, uh, their shit, which is good for the soil, but also because it gifts mushrooms, magic mushrooms. Um, Hetaru is uh, an Indian tradition, Lakshmi, goddess Lakshmi. And um, I just want to put this up because I think um, that is undervalued psychedelics in religion aspects. And I'm not going to read all of this, but I'll start with this quote. This is an article, uh, or this is uh, from a book. And it says, no exploration into yoga and meditation would be complete without a look at the ancient lineage of sacred plants and herbs that many assert are the origins of religion experience and spirituality, um, and the rest I will tell you. I find this quote so important, maybe because I really want my mom to believe it, because yes, we live in a drug hysteria, but we need a deeper understanding um, of all these plant medicines, because I don't like to call them drugs, and not to rub them you know, in one corner and label them as dark and as dangerous, because these plant medicines are very valuable and many Practices come out of it, and they have been used by many shamans and yogis, and you name it, to bestow health and wealth and to communicate with the divine. So it's very important. And in my own experience, one of my first uh, mushroom trips uh, when I took psychedelics, I started to do things that I never thought I could. Suddenly, I was playing with energy and doing qigong. I was doing many different body practices that I didn't know that I had the ability to do it, um, and 
what I do now, I really use psychedelics to engage or to enhance my yoga practice because it really allows me to connect with my body and to have this check in and see what is happening and balance everything and release the things that I no longer need. Um, this is a quote from uh, the Veda. Uh, I have tasted the sweet drink of life knowing that it inspires good thoughts and joyous expansiveness to the extreme that all the gods and mortals seek it together, calling it honey, Soma has climbed upon us, expanding endlessly. Uh, I want to give you these two references if you'd like to read more about Soma. Um, in India. And just to round up, because I think I have one more minute. Um, you know, I think our goal in life is just to explore ourselves and, uh, you know, to let go of the programs that we don't need to unlearn those programs and to relearn the things that do empower us um, and the things that we do aspire. And there are just different ways of doing it. So yoga, in my opinion, is not just a body practice, but it's like all body practices that, um, that support you in becoming your true self. And you know, you can use yoga, you can use uh, qigong, you can use dancing because also dancing can bring you into an altered state of consciousness. You can use meditation, you can use psychedelics, but just choose whatever fits your personality, what fits you in your season right now, and just make the best of it. <laughs>